up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. It's right down there and it's free. That enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like our content, share it, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one. We appreciate you guys' support and getting us this far. Now, today we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by Remedy. Thank you for coming through, sir. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you having me. Much respect. Thank you, man. Nothing but gratitude. Thank you. Yes, yes. So Remedy has, of course, a lot of great material in his catalog, and he just recently put out the Remedy Meets the Wu-Tang album that uh, I've really enjoyed, and uh, definitely want to shout out Chris Schwartz for connecting us, uh, getting us... Oh, yeah, Chris Schwartz. Rough House. So as you speak of Rough House, I know you have the Remedy Meets Wu-Tang album, but then you're doing a special vinyl thing with Rough House that's going to be coming out. So can you break down what that is and what it involves? Chris found me. Thank God he did. He sought me out and found me. I guess after he heard the album, he was uh, he, he, he was proud. So he came and searched me out and told me he now owns in a, a vinyl plant. He presses and distributes vinyl. Um, of course, I knew who he was. You know, he's, he's a legend in the game. Um, but to be honest with you, I know we're, we're releasing vinyl and we got a couple of bundles and packages, but honestly, he's putting all that together. <laughs> I just asked him yesterday, I told him, I'm a little confused. I'm not sure how, how are we doing this and what's going on exactly. Remedy, don't worry, I got you, this and that. I think we're getting together next week. He's been sending me all these like amazing uh, color pop, like it's a new thing they're doing with the vinyl or something, these, these, these covers. Um, he's been sending me a whole bunch of them. They all look great, but I'm a little lost when it comes to the vinyl world myself, you know, I'm not going to lie. So I'm going to let him handle that. But yes, we definitely have physicals coming for the album and only due to re big requests. Honestly, I didn't even plan on doing any physicals when I first dropped the album. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, this is uh, Remedy Meets Wu-Tang's definitely an album that lends itself to vinyl because of the, the sound. And I know that you co-produced it, and I don't want to mispronounce Danny's last name. So who, how do you pronounce Danny's last name that co-produced the album with you? Danny Cayazzo. Cayazzo. You know, yeah, he's got three vowels in a row, like an A, an I, and another A. So you know, it's that Italian stuff. Yes. <laughs> Cayazzo, yeah. My secret weapon right there. Yeah, now he's also done a lot of Wu-related stuff uh, prior to Remedy Meets Wu-Tang. So how did you guys connect? Uh, actually, it was a mutual friend who hooked us up uh, a couple of years back, said, you know, Danny's a big Wu fan. He's been making beats for several years. You guys got to connect. So one time I had him come down to the studio. I have a studio in Staten Island. Um, one time I had him come to the studio. You know, he played me uh, folders of beats. Some of them were really amazing. So, you know, we kept them around and it took a few years to finally get like guys jumping on the tracks and doing things. But any album that I'm executive producing that has that Wu sound, I bring Danny in because he makes those, you know, he makes those beats. Right. Uh, so, yeah, we did the executive, uh, Inspector Deck album together. We did the Ghostface Killers album. And now we're doing this one. Yeah. The uh, Chamber Number no. 9 Inspector Deck album. And both of those, uh, that and the Ghostface Killers came out in 2019. Obviously, Correct. you've been working with the Wu for decades now. What, why in 2019 did you have this output that kind of kicked off the charts on the executive production side with 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 deck and with ghostface um i've been around for years i guess um i guess you could say behind the scenes kind of uh i actually executive produced inspector deck's manifesto album in 2010 i think it was i executive produced capadonna's the struggle album in 2003 uh, I worked on one of those The Swarm albums and also 2010 around. And, you know, I had the studio for years. So, deck, you know, all the guys come through, make music. And, you know, we just start talking and building. And it just led to a couple of different deals and scenarios and situations where, you know, where we all make music and uh, we're all into the quality. And we just came up with the idea, hey, let's let's do this album together. Let, let's try to make something something magical. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Now back to Remedy Meets Wu Tang, though. That's the new the new album that you got. Um, and how do you, as a as a rapper and a producer, how do you balance shifting back and forth between the two? Um, that's a good question. I just you know life is a life is a balance in general. 
so I just I just take it all in and I try to when I'm doing you know you have to segregate your time when you when you're trying to write raps you really got to sit down and write your raps when you're trying to make the music you got to focus on the task at hand and that's making music and then you know it becomes a lovely you know with the combination of the two what that's what counts that's that's the that's the goal okay now the beginning of the album remedy meets Wu Tang you got right out the gate you got Ghostface on the first track and Inspector Deck on the second one with Death Defying. So what made you want to sequence the album that way to get those two right out the gate? That's a good question. Uh, sequencing, actually, I take so much pride in sequencing albums. To me, that's one of my specialties. And um, to me, the fluidity of an album is really extremely important besides the music and the rhymes, obviously, and the individual songs. It's how it flows. Uh, so when I, when, when I first made, when we did the first song, Modern Day Miracle, the intro to the album, first I'll tell you that I did like uh, hours of research, watching movies, taking notes, chopping and pasting. And a couple of times I went to the studio, I told the engineer today, we're just gonna, we're just gonna cut out like samples and little uh, intros and outros and music breaks. We're just gonna do skits for the album. So I spent hours, a couple of days doing that. Then once I had all the songs, you know, it's only right. Same way how Ghostface kind of, Ghostface catch the blast of a hype for he set off the first Wu album. And I had that verse of his and I said, damn, it would only be right. Go starts the album off with this. Then I intertwined that the uh, the skits in there to kind of set up the intro nice. You know how it's like, um, yeah, I kind of made it like it was a seance and, you know, we're being inducted. Uh, and it just all molded, it all molded together perfectly. And that's how I came with the ghost, the ghost intro and then brought him on the first track. Originally, Death Defying was going to be the first song on the album. Until I got the skits right and figured it all out, that was the first song. But then I switched it up once I got the skits. And uh, yeah, then I just put Rebel second. And um, that was that one, really. Yeah. And, and Rebel, as usual, comes through. But um, one other thing I thought was interesting, too, is that the Remedy meets Wu-Tang. Like, you've known these guys for so long. So how or why did you use that title? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I didn't just meet them. Uh, it's just like that's that's the thing that's going on. You know, it's like something time they use the X now instead of meets or verses. You know, they always have so and so verse so and so. It was just you know, it's it's my album. It's it's not a solo album. Obviously, it's more of a compilation, but I still have thirty percent of it is pretty much my solo joints, and it just seemed the best way to get across the, what I was trying to do with the Wu Tang sound and having the members on the album. In, into that to, to the degree that I do, it just seemed like it made the most sense. And Deck, Deck even said to me, yo, Rem, you got any other titles you could use? You know, like anything besides Remedy meets Wu-Tang? This was like when we were, I was in the process, he didn't really understand it fully. I didn't either until it all just, I've been working on this album for a couple of years. Hmm. Um, so, but one, once it all made sense, it just seemed like the, the only the only title I could use it would only be right. What was what was it gonna have? Like a remedy, the truth serum, or what could it have been featuring the woo that without letting I wanted people to know? Okay. Well, speaking of flows and letting people know, Sparrow is one of my favorite, if not my favorite, mm -hmm. solo song that you have on Remedy Meets Wu Tang Clan. And that that I think your flow is so immaculate and so precise in particular. Um, do you remember? anything happening differently when you were writing or creating that song to where you were so on pocket to, on that one? It's funny you say that because that's actually my favorite song on the album. I got a video for that too. It's coming out in like probably a week or so. Um, but before I had Sparrow, I had Calculated Risk, which is another solo song on the album. And that was my favorite. But then when I made Sparrow, it just took me over kind of. To me, both of those songs is soulful and it's, it's just me giving you me, man. I kind of didn't try to get intricate with the writing or like the flow patterns or anything. I kind of dumbed down the lyrics even, just simple stuff to me, but it's just me being me and giving you who Remedy is and what I believe in and stand for and just basics really, it's really basics. Right. Well, I think uh, sometimes they say it's complex in the simplicity, so. It, maybe, indeed, exactly. So maybe that's what exactly. it is. Maybe that's yes. what it is. Now on Pulpit, it's kind of uh, bridging the gap between two mighty New York crews with having Conway on there, Conway the Machine, of course. So how how and why did you link up with them and want to put them on Remedy Meets Wu-Tang? 
that's a whole yeah. every song has a, a backstory behind it so the backstory to the pulpit is when we were putting ghost album together the ghost face killers album in 2019 we were trying to get conway west side ray and ghost on the song because you know every people been asking you know they 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 compare Wu and griselda you know ever since griselda's been popping they seem to that seems to be the comparison or griselda's the new Wu or the new street shit you know um so we know the fans always want a ghost and Conway to be on a song. So we did the, I, we got the Conway verse. First I played the beat for ghost and ghost was like, damn, I like the beat, but I need to hear someone else on it before I could get going with it. So I said, okay, we sent it to Conway. We were trying to get this on ghost album originally sent it to Conway within two days. Conway sent the verse back. Boom. He killed it. It was beautiful. We tried getting West side. I think he, I forgot what he was doing, but he was busy. It didn't really work out. So we ended up having, and then, Believe it or not, the first time Ghost came out of his house after the COVID joint, after the COVID, for being stuck in for like a year, he came to my studio and recorded the Conway verse. And we still didn't even know what we were doing with it at that time. Originally, I was going to just let him and Conway be on the song with Kappa doing the hook. I wasn't even going to get on it. And then everyone's like, no, Rem, it's your album. You got to get on the song. So I, I just wrote a verse and um, jumped on that. But that's actually, I think, the first song where Ghost and Conway are together. I think we beat Russ. We beat Russ to it. Okay. So Russ with a chump too. Right. Yeah, he has Conway and Ghost on the track too. But I think we beat him to it. And I think that's really the first song with Ghost and Conway together. And that's just something I wanted to give to the fans because they deserve it, man. They, 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 they've been looking for that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, uh, it's a, great, a great song. Another one yeah. that I think is great is uh, Crazy Eights. And that one in particular is Method Man uh, as far as the guest appearances. And with him... The thing that I think is so remarkable is that he sounds more or less like it could be 1993 again, and <laughs> only in the best way. Ghostface rhymes different and his styles is different and all that, but Meth is still like... Oh, Meth is top notch. Yeah. I, think he's actually, I think he's still getting better, unbelievably, you know? It's, yeah. it's just amazing. He really is. His flows, his, his punchlines, everything. Well, you've been around him for decades now. What what is it about him as a writer, as a as a lyricist that's enabled him to advance, but also sound so classic at the same time? I think a couple of things. Um, one, he studies the game, and he really um, he loves it, and he love. I think he really loves rapping. And his writing techniques have evolved as well. His punchlines now are so much more like intricate. You know, he's got so many multiple meanings in his verses. You really have to listen to him a couple of times and break them down. But yeah, Meth, to me, Meth is one of them guys. He just gets better and better with time. He's amazing. Yeah, that's for sure. He's in Meth was actually the reason. So Meth comes to my studio sometimes to record. And after he laid the, he was actually the last guy to get on Crazy Eights. And one day he came to the studio and was like, yo, Rem, when are we going to do that video? I was like, what video? He's like, the shit I laid the eight bars for a couple of weeks ago or whatever. I was like, oh, shit, you would do a video for that? He was like, yeah, man, let's go. And once he said that, it just planted the whole seed to get it going. And somehow we mag I magically pulled it off, man. People ask me, yo, Rem, how did you do that? How did you get, you really pulled it off? How did you get everybody together? And I yell, <laughs> luck, timing, uh, relationships, trust, all of that plays, plays a key probably. Yeah, which leads in nicely to one of my other favorite songs, which is To Say the Least. And that one, that one, I like it because of the social commentary you have on there. And that's something that's been a hallmark uh, of your career, throughout your career. So why is that something that's so important for you about needing to help and teach each other and be there for each other as people? Why is that something that you want to rap about? Okay, well, To Say the Least, that's a great record too. I actually have a video for that too. That's that'll be coming next time the next riot that breaks out. <laughs> um, but when I grew up in hip hop, it was all about substance, the content, you know, the voice of the street and the people, which is some kind of what's been lost in today's hip hop. You know, there's not too much substance and lyrical content anymore, unfortunately. But that's what always um, attracted me and intrigued me about hip hop. So as I became an artist, I said I have to. I think the first song I wrote hip hop wise was called like reach out and teach someone instead of reach out and touch someone. What was that? The old expression for something? Right. Now, yeah. Reach. I was into KRS kind of, you know, I was a big fan of KRS, the teacher. Uh, and he was always dropping knowledge and jewels. So 
I wasn't going to rap unless I was doing it for a reason and a purpose and a cause. You know, I don't just want to make, you know, I wasn't just into making stuff or, you know, even RZA told me years ago, you know, you want to blow up in the game. You kind of have to sell out, sign for the major labels and do all that other stuff. And I was never really into that. Hmm. Uh, and I just think it's important, man. Look, we're all humans, man. Humanity, we're all in this together. So I have to be, I have to say something important to, pe to the people, man, whether they're my people or whether anyone, we're all humans. We're all in this, we're all in the same game. We're on the same boat. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.